Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have a kind of surprise upload for you guys. Before we get into this upload, though, a couple links I'd like to share. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch store to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch link is actually displayed right under this video. Also, Dogman, Frightening Encounters, Volume 1, 2, and 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeffrey Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload, shall we? So the reason why I said today's upload is kind of special is because I am going to pick a story or an encounter out of each audiobook. There are three. That way you guys can get a little sample of them. Christmas is coming and maybe you can buy yourself a gift or someone else that special Dogman audiobook for Christmas. But here's a sample of the first, second, and third audiobook. I have not seen a dog man myself, but my grandfather used to talk about it all the time, which led to my interest in the topic. He lived in a very small town in Indiana known as Batesville. I just checked while I'm writing this, and the current population is right around 6,400. I haven't been back to that town since Grandpa Eric passed away 12 years ago. But he had quite a few acres to himself. I'm not overplaying how relevant the dogman was to my grandfather. He even always said that his obsession with the rare creature was the main reason my grandmother divorced him and moved to the Chicago area to be closer to her sister. My grandpa was a tax accountant for the majority of his life. And according to him, it was while he was on his way to the office one day that he saw a dog man cross the road. He always described it as being by far the largest animal he had ever seen. He referred to it as the wolf man until he read some books that mentioned dog man are a legitimate species that merely has yet to be publicized by the mainstream science. According to my grandfather, the dog man jumped in front of his car causing him to slam on his brakes. And it ran alongside the road before jumping back onto the street, causing the only other car on the road to swerve into the grass. Understandably, neither he nor the other driver was brave enough to step out of their vehicles, and the other person drove off before my grandfather could confirm what they had just witnessed. When I was a child, that story always thrilled me. As I grew older, I started to wonder how much truth there was to his stories. I wondered how much they could have been embellished. But over the last five years, I have read all sorts of books, and I've watched many videos on YouTube, and it is no secret that people all over the world experience events that are just as alarming, if not more. Doing that helped me to realize... That my grandfather's encounters were just a few of millions. I remember him going as far as to say that he was grateful to the dog man for exposing itself to him because his life had become so mundane before that. Even though that first sighting shook him to his core, he stated that it added mystery and intrigue to his existence. At the risk of sounding comical, I suppose you could say, he became somewhat of a dogman detective. I don't know how long it was after he had his initial sighting, but he returned to the scene at the time when the traffic would be minimal. He always said he got the impression that the creature was trying to intimidate him and the other driver and to steer them out of the area. He thought that maybe it was guarding something. His hunch might have been correct as he discovered a large skeleton that only could have belonged to a cow. It was about 80% consumed and was cleverly hidden within a ditch 
that was between a barbed wire fence and some brush. As he glanced around the area, he spotted the cows way off in the distance on the other side of the fence. That disturbed my grandfather because it likely meant that the dog man tossed the body of an adult-sized cow over the fence. Keep in mind that the average weight of a fully grown cow is 1,500 pounds. The possibility that anyone or anything could have lifted something that heavy off the ground and avoided injury is staggering. My grandfather also claimed that there was enormous droppings nearby the carcass. That further affirmed to him that the creature may be dwelling in that area. Suddenly, he got the idea that it wasn't too wise to be sticking around there without any means of protection. He did talk about how an intense feeling of fear washed over him at that moment. I think these cryptids are extremely interesting, but I would have hightailed it out of there long before he got that bad feeling. Because he was in such a small town, it wasn't long before he started telling locals about what he had encountered, especially amid throwing back a few cold ones at the local watering hole. I don't think it was to anyone's surprise when people began to mock him. I'm sure that even he expected that to happen. Still, his obsession continued, and he would frequently drive all over the country roads keeping an eye out for anything strange. Because of his interest in the subject matter, he was staying out more and more and spending less time with my grandmother. She didn't like how everyone would ask her about how her husband's werewolf investigations were going. Apparently, she never believed that whatever he saw was a cryptid. She insisted that it must have been an oversized stray mongrel. Eventually, that led to a lot of conflict between my grandparents. Thus, they ended up separating and remained that way. There's no doubt that my grandfather went through some hard times. His wife had left him, and he was so fixated on proving to everyone who knew him that he hadn't imagined the creature. One night, he pulled over on the side of the road after having had a little too much liquor, and one of the local police officers walked up to the driver's side door, woke him up to make sure that he was all right. Since my grandfather was extremely drunk, he had expected to get arrested. Instead, the young police officer revealed to him that he too had seen the dog man. That was the first time that anyone had openly admitted to him that he wasn't alone on the subject matter, even though my grandfather knew he wasn't crazy. This knowledge helped him to feel more at ease. Allegedly, the young police officer had responded to an emergency call that happened near the edge of town. It was an older woman who claimed that a wolf man had eaten her pit bull. Though he didn't believe some of the specifics of her story at first, he was very startled when he checked out the remains of the pit bull. He said that little more than a skeleton remained and that he was amazed at how quickly the mystery predator stripped the poor pet of its flesh. He said that it was while he was shining the flashlight on the skeleton that the predator came charging out of the woods and forced him back inside. Together he and the homeowner watched the large dog man as it proceeded to gnaw on the remains, often spitting various bones as though they were nothing thicker than toothpicks. It's probably needless to say that the officer called for backup, but even though they responded quickly, it was too late. The dog man had already carried the remaining bones into the meadow that surrounded the property, never to return that night. He received news. The homeowner died not too long after that, so he couldn't be sure whether the ferocious predator still lingered in the vicinity. The officer didn't provide the exact address, but my grandfather remembered that an old widow had recently died, and he knew that a dense meadow surrounded her house. He thanked the officer for being so kind and understanding, and he headed for home. I believe it was the following day that he went to go and check out the property that he suspected the officer referred to. Since nobody seemed to have purchased the place, he had no trouble walking into the backyard and taking a glimpse at the meadow. That's how ballsy of a guy my grandfather was. If he wanted something, he'd go after it. 
If there were consequences to his actions, he was willing to take them on. Having no complications the first time around, he ended up visiting the property multiple times and even brought a Polaroid camera hoping to finally obtain a bit of proof. According to my grandfather, he spotted the dog man during his fourth visit when he went there at dusk. He claimed that he saw its head poke out of the meadow. Since nobody seemed to be occupying the house, his theory was that the creature had been sleeping in the meadow. He said it was so high and dense that it would have been the best location in the area to hide. I would have provided enough, it would have provided enough cover while also allowing easy access to prey like rabbit and deer. He snapped a few shots with his Polaroid camera. Apparently the creature acted intrigued every time the shutter sounded off. There was something about its body language at that moment that made him feel more at ease. The creature didn't seem at all interested in pursuing him. My grandfather would joke about how it must have recently fed, thus causing it to essentially dismiss its presence. He guessed that the creature was about 80 yards out into the meadow, but that its height eliminated the possibility that it could have been anything else. I want to mention that I've read Tom's book, Stranger from the Meadow, and it fascinated me that both the Sasquatch species and Dogman species could utilize some of the same strategies. My grandfather claimed that there was always a very ominous feeling when he was near this creature's territory. He strongly believed that it was the same creature that he saw on both occasions. Also, although he believed to have had only seen one of them, he often talked about how there must have been more of them in the area. He thought that idea that there could only be one Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, Yeti, etc. was absurd and it was no different regarding the dog man. To him, no creature would remain in a location that didn't present an opportunity to reproduce. That would go against nature in every way. The photographs turned out surprisingly good, at least in my opinion, but when my grandfather would show them to the locals, they tended to brush him off. Not a single person aside from the friendly police officer took them at all seriously. Since they were Polaroids, they heavily faded over time, but they were in still good enough quality to make out a tall figure standing in the middle of the meadow. I thought about submitting them to this publication, but I was worried that people would just accuse them of being staged. It's interesting how so many people will so willingly to hear about encounters of this nature, but once you claim to have photographic evidence, the naysayers come after you. There is one more encounter story that my grandfather told me about, but I thought I might better save it for another issue of Dogman Frightening Encounters. Maybe Tom will be able to persuade me to share the photographs. If you have had encounters with the Sasquatch or Dogman species, I recommend that you shoot Tom a message or me. He loves to discuss your experiences, so do I, and is one of the nicest dudes involved in the Bigfoot community. So am I. Just kidding, guys. I wasn't kidding about being a nice person. I was just kidding how I threw my two cents in. All right. Today's second encounter from a different volume of Dogman Frightening Encounters. Hello everyone, my name is Sid and I had an encounter with a creature while conducting Sasquatch research up near Mount Rainier. I was never intimidated by the idea of crossing paths with a Sasquatch, but I am confident that many others will agree that a run-in into a dogman is an entirely different story. I've been interested in Sasquatch ever since I was a child and saw the famous Patterson-Gimlin film. When I saw that, it was as if it brought life to a brand new person, sparking a passion that I had never felt before. I lived just outside of Seattle at the time and on weekends would beg my mother and father to take me out into the national parks so that I could search for footprints. I should mention that I've seen Sasquatch more than once, but it's always been from a great distance. I've never been close enough to one of them to make out facial features or the smell their breath, like with Tom. 
that's why I think it's more interesting that I encountered this other, even rarer creature up close. It was around the beginning of the summer of 2005 when I decided to head out on a solo expedition. I usually went with a friend or two, but both of the guys who were interested in the subject were busy on this particular occasion. I didn't always do things this way, but I remember it had been a while since I went camping, so I decided to go all out and go on a backpacking excursion that took you on something like a 10 mile journey. I always like to take my time with those kinds of journeys because I'm a firm believer that this is a subject you have to be more patient with than more other things. Some people might think that I'm loony for saying this, but I don't think you can expect to do good Sasquatch investigation while you have a frantic energy. I do think that this species can sense that sort of thing. Now, that's just my opinion. I've been doing this stuff for years, and it's constantly been the case where I've found tracks and other signs of their presence when I'm feeling centered. Of course, it could just be because my awareness is improved when I'm centered, therefore I notice more of my surroundings than otherwise. It was the second night of my hike, and the skies were beautiful. But I decided to take my chances with unforeseen bad weather and remove the rain guard from the top of the tent. I've been asleep for some time, although I'm not sure how long I was awoken by the sound of these unordinary breaths that seemed to be coming from somewhere very close to my tent. These breaths were so raspy that I got the impression whatever was responsible for them was very sick possibly even on the verge of death, because it didn't sound like any animal I had ever heard before. I, of course, speculated whether it was a Sasquatch that was snooping around my camp. The area I was in is known for frequent activity, so I got pretty excited. A bit nervous, but excited nonetheless. I continued to lie there on my back as still as possible, listening to everything that was going on outside the wall of my fabric shelter. I could hear it sniffing the little area where I had built a fire to cook my freeze-dried food. I was quite intrigued until I watched the silhouette of a gigantic hand run its fingers across the outer wall of my tent. The moonlight was just enough to provide me with a visual of the shape of its hand. Now I've always believed Sasquatch to be potentially dangerous, if in a position where it felt threatened, but I quickly realized that this was no Sasquatch. On the tips of the fingers, there were very long nails, nails that were too long to be considered fingernails. They were claws. When it lightly brushed its claws against the fabric, this creature must have been in a position where it was nearly lying down, because soon after that, I could see the silhouette of the figure rise and peek over the top of the tent. Now, since I didn't have the rain guard on, I got a darn good view of this thing's face. Even though it was dark outside, my vision was adjusted enough to see the whites of its eyes and the bright white and yellow teeth that lined the extensive snout. I watched those jaws open wide and let out a very sick sounding inhale and exhale. It was at this moment that I realized I was terrified. I don't think I could have moved even if my life depended on it. This dog man looked so evil, so sinister, so predatory that I convinced myself I was a goner. It seemed like any split second that it would lunge at me through the screen of the tent and instantly shred me into little morsels. I couldn't tell you how long we stared at one another, but it felt as though I was holding my breath the entire time, bracing myself for the incoming agony. Suddenly its head swiveled in a different direction and it instantly moved out of sight. It had to have rapidly left the area because I never heard another peep from it. I continued to lie there, wide-eyed as ever, staring at the screen of the tent until the sky lit up. This may surprise many, but I did end up completing the hike within the next two days and even proceeded to continue my investigations. The only difference was that I started keeping an eye out for something other than Sasquatch. 
I believe I was able to find peace with what happened since I was inches away from the beast and wasn't attacked. When I've told other investigators about what happened that night, they tend to ask me if I'm certain I was not dreaming. Imagine that. We're talking about people who conduct regular Sasquatch research that treat me as if I'm delusional. It's not everyone, only a select few, but I think it serves as a fine example of how people ridicule each other, even amongst the believer community. There is so much more to this world than many of us feel comfortable enough to believe. Today's third encounter from the third volume of Dogman Frightening Encounters. I had an encounter with something incredibly strange back in the early 80s, but it wasn't until within the last few years that I started referring to it as a dogman. My father owned a go-kart track in northern Wisconsin. To make a long story short, I inherited it, and then I sold it before moving to North Carolina. My cousins and I were in our early teens, and we were racing around the track one afternoon. It had gotten to the point where we didn't spend too much time on the track anymore since we had done it so much. However, it was storming that day and it always made for a much more thrilling ride when the track was soaked. Additionally, the business would always close during bad weather, so it would enable us to have the place to ourselves. We loved to swerve all over the place and ram into each other and the wet track would increase the ability to do that. I guess it was because we were so close to the ground that we were never worried about getting struck by lightning. When you're a kid, you often feel invincible. However, I remember how seeing the creature made me question that notion. One of my cousins was in front of me and I was desperately trying to catch up so that I could make him spin out of control. As I closed in on him, he suddenly put on the brakes because a large animal ran across the track, not too far off in front of him. The first thing I noticed, even before I could analyze the predator, was that there was a dead dog of some kind in its mouth. The carcass was too mangled to tell whether it was a wild dog or a house pet, but it was a decent sized canine. I don't know if I'm describing this accurately. But the way it ran across the circuit reminded me of how some dinosaurs ran, mainly raptors. Its arms were curled up in front of its chest, and its torso leaned forward. Its large jaws made it look very easy to transport prey. I should also mention that it seemed to pay no attention to us whatsoever. It, apparent, it appeared only interested in getting its kill to a safe location, so that it could indulge in peace. Even though the creature didn't care about us, it still had the worst feeling in the pit of my stomach. Strangely enough, both of my cousins agreed that they had the same feeling. It felt as though we were not meant to be in the same place as this creature, like it was from a different world, one where we did not belong. All three of us slowly drove our carts, watching the creature run into the woods and desperately hoping that it would not return. We still often talk about the incident, and although the rest of our family believes we saw something, weird, they don't exactly believe that we saw something that was running on two legs and had a wolf's head. It seems as if it's become somewhat of a legend among the family. I don't have any kids yet, but my parents enjoy telling one of my cousin's kids about our story. It seems to have added a lot of mystery and intrigue to my little cousin's life. And stuff like that makes me wonder about all of the myths and legends that have been passed down throughout the generations across all cultures. Maybe there's a lot of truth among those stories, and they have just been tweaked throughout time. I lived very close to that go-kart track, but had never heard anything out of the ordinary. It's amazing how something like this creature could have shown up completely undetected. That sure does make me wonder how often these things could be around, yet we have no clue. Heck, there could be one or two of them right outside of your living space right now, and you would never know it. That's one of the main reasons that I like Tom's book so much. His writing style encourages you to question things like this. 
I'll admit that sometimes I wonder if these creatures are in fact werewolves. As I get older, this existence becomes more and more perplexing, as there seems to be less and less explanation for everything that mystifies us. It's almost like there's more that scientists discover, and more we learn that we know so very little. I mean, I now scoff at people who claim to have the understanding of how everything works. Who is to say that a man cannot transform into a monster since metamorphosis is real, documented thing? Why is this looked at as an impossibility with mainstream news so hell-bent on scaring us daily? You would think that they would utilize more of these truly frightening things. Really, I can't think of anything more intimidating than the idea of running into a dogman while hiking by myself. I've noticed that my cousin won't even allow his kids to be any further than five feet from him when they are outside. It's a disturbing thing to say, but a child would be such an easy snack for what we saw that day on that track. As time moves on, it's interesting how you start to accept something so uncanny. I think it goes to show that the human brain can eventually process and accept anything. Don't think for a second that these creatures are not running around out there. They are. And they could be closer than you think. Alright guys, so like that guy said in his story, um, he had read Strangers from the Meadow, another Tom Lyons book. Now Tom has some amazing cryptid books. Um, he really does his research when he writes these books. They are very good. I, I probably own about four or five, maybe six, um, of his books. Definitely more than six. I'm sorry. And on my Amazon Paperwhite. And, um, the, all his books are available on Amazon as well as his audio books, uh, on Audible. Uh, what he has on there. Um, but yeah, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1, 2, and 3. They were researched and written by Tom Lyons. And they were narrated and produced by me, Jeffrey Nadalny. And they are uh, available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. And guys, the links are in the description below. Not too bad. Um, I think they're priced pretty fairly. So if that's something you're interested in doing, it makes a good Christmas present. No, enough of the sales pitch. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And please be kind to each other. And may the Great Spirit watch over all of us and guide us through our path in life. Farewell, my friends, until tomorrow.